Hey everybody, I'm Greg Jarrett. Welcome to our live book signing for this book, Witch Hunt, uh, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history. You can obviously buy it here, and I hope you do. Uh, you can obviously get it in bookstores beginning Tuesday, tomorrow. Um, and, you know, this is a story that is actually uh, the sequel to my first book, which was called uh, The Russia Hoax, uh, The Illicit Scheme to Clear Hillary Clinton Frame Donald Trump. Right next to me is the host for tonight's live book signing, which is my friend, DeRoy Murdoch. Take it away. Great hey. to see you. Pleasure. Uh, thanks very much to those of you tuning in here at uh, uh, Facebook and on YouTube. We're coming to you from Midtown Manhattan. I'm very happy to be here with Greg, my Fox News colleague. I'm a Fox News contributor and also a contributing editor with National Review Online. And as Greg said, we're here to talk about uh, witch hunt at this live signing. And I thought I'd uh, begin this discussion by invoking none other than Charles Dickens. Ah. And in his uh, classic book, A Tale of Two Cities, he began it with the famous words, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times. And the opening words of witch hunt reminded me of this uh, exact quote from this book. And you wrote in your book, Witch Hunt, inventing a lie is easy, spreading a lie is even easier. That's how the book begins. And so just to start off, I thought I'd ask you, what did you mean when you penned those words at the start of witch hunt? You know, I felt this compulsion to expose a lie and unravel the truth. Um, and I remember many years ago reading George Orwell who said what propels him to write a story is his desire to expose a lie and to tell the truth. And I felt the exact same way. This was a pernicious lie uh, that was perpetrated against uh, the sitting president of the United States in order to undo the election results of 2016, to drive him from office, to destroy his presidency, and, and frankly, it's still going on. Now, um, you mentioned George Orwell. Another George, the not, a very interesting expression I like, is George Will. Right. Uh, he uses a phrase that, that I really like hearing, which is collective hallucination. And mm -hmm. I thought of this when I saw the subtitle of Witch Hunt, which is uh, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history. Uh, do you think it would be fair to use George Will's, ter uh, George Will's term, collective hallucination, to describe yes. the witch hunt, uh, the, uh, the effort against President Trump, the Russia hoax, and all the uh, effort, uh, all the uh, uh, controversy in which he and his inner circle have been embroiled. Yeah, I think so. It's synonymous with uh, mass delusion, the subtitle of my book. How is it possible that a powerful group of unelected officials operating in the shadows of secrecy were able to convince tens of millions of Americans that Donald Trump was a traitor without a shred of evidence? Uh, you know, the thing about witch hunts, the title of my book, Witch Hunt, is yes, because President Trump often referred to it as such, but it, it really fits because the thing people forget about witch hunts is that there are no real witches. Uh, it is this overwhelming and irrational uh, desire to believe that there are witches. And in this particular case, the belief that the president had committed the most noxious crime in, in American uh, criminal codes. And, and that is, you know, this treasonous conspiracy hatched with Vladimir Putin in the bowels of the Kremlin. Um, and there was no evidence of that. And one of the things I point out in Witch Hunt is that uh, we now know from the words of those, some of the words of those behind the Witch Hunt is that they admitted in private sessions with Congress that when they launched the FBI investigation in the summer of 2016, they did not have credible evidence. Nine months later, when the special counsel was appointed, they still didn't have any evidence. So it wasn't just a hoax, but a witch hunt in the truest sense. Incredible. Now, do you think that this whole effort was uh, fueled by any uh, ideological or policy differences by uh, Donald Trump's uh, detractors against him, or was this just nothing more than basically old-fashioned, unbridled hatred against Donald J. Trump? It's a little bit of everything. Um, insofar as corrupt officials at the FBI, the Department of Justice, the deep state as they're often known, I actually refer to them in my book as the malignant force. These people were the swamp. 
And Trump vowed to drain the swamp. The swamp did not want to be drained. You know, these are people with immense power, unelected officials as they may be. Um, and, you know, power in Washington is like crack cocaine. Uh, you know, once you start smoking it, you, you'll do anything to keep it going. And these people saw Trump as a threat to their own power, and they decided that they were going to destroy him by conjuring this pernicious lie, as I refer to it. Now, I took a look at the Mueller report and took a look at the timeline of uh, uh, his uh, investigation and the sense at some point where no, there's not much here. Yeah, there's a and, timeline in the book, by the way. Correct. And I got the sense that probably by about roughly August 2018, uh, Mueller should have said, you know, we've looked at this, there's nothing there. The sensible thing, I think, would have been for him to come forward and say, look, there's no Russian collusion. Maybe there's obstruction, but right. as for the Russian collusion, it's not there. He didn't do anything like that. About 90 days later, we had a midterm election here. Right. And I think that the Mueller report, without that exoneration, or at least the, the uh, lack of evidence of collusion, and being able to at least have that taken uh, from over Trump's head and the head of the GOP, essentially, uh, meant that Trump and the GOP were going to the midterm election with this big question mark. Is the President of the United States a Russian agent? Right. Uh, is he taking uh, orders from the Kremlin, et cetera? And I think, and do you share my view, that, that Mueller essentially put his thumb on the, on the scale of oh, the midterm totally election did. by not at least taking that off, off of Trump's head. He did. What you'll read in the book, Witch Hunt, and again, I hope you'll buy it tonight on the live signing, but one of the most amazing and really disheartening stories is that Mueller actually knew within months of his appointment that there was no evidence of collusion. He knew, according to Trump's lawyers, um, by November, December of 2017. He was appointed in May of 2017. But there is a pivotal meeting. I'll give you the date, March 5th, 2018. That's a full year before the Mueller report. Trump's lawyers meet with Mueller and several members of his team of partisans. And Mueller confesses that there's no exposure for the president on collusion. They had no evidence of this uh, criminal collusion conspiracy with Russia. Admits it. And so uh, Dowd says, well, why don't you end it? What, what are you doing? And Mueller said, well, we want to look at the president for obstruction. And uh, Mueller says, and we, if you don't let us interview the president of the United States, we're going to go to a court and compel him through a subpoena. And at this point in time, a shouting match ensues. I recount it in the book. And Dowd pounds his fist on the table and says, go ahead. Give it a try. You've got nothing to stand on. And there's more to it than that. But I agree with you that on that date, March 5th, 2018, you know, Mueller should have done the right thing and said, we will file an interim report that there is no evidence of collusion. We may pursue obstruction. But that would have changed the dynamic. So the question Enormous. is, why didn't he do that? Did he do that? Did, did he not do that because he wanted to influence the upcoming midterm elections? Uh, and shift control of the House from Republicans to Democrats. To pose the question, I think, is to answer the question. Incredible. Well, you'll find the answers to these questions, many others, in this book. Which I guess I, I better start signing these Maybe you should start signing, signing these. The All story right. of the greatest mass delusion in American political history. The book's right here. If you'd like a copy, go to witchhuntbook.com, and you can order that and, uh, and get into the details of this uh, truly frightening, frightening situation. Now, um, Greg Jarrett, the author of this wonderful book, uh, there are many names we've heard, those of us who have been following this case, uh, FBI Chief James Comey, Acting FBI Chief uh, Andrew McCabe, uh, Top FBI Staffer Peter Strzok, his mistress Lisa Page, the, we've heard these names in the news. Um, was this just sort of a, a bunch of people trying to bring Trump down, kind of each in his own way or her way, or was there a single ringleader, if you would, who was sort of the, the person pushing this whole thing along and uh, pulling the strings? It's a great question. I, I think it was a collective effort, uh, a meeting of the minds, mutual consent. Um, isn't it interesting, the very same people who launched and pursued the witch hunt against Donald Trump are the very same people who cleared Hillary Clinton, even though they knew she had committed multiple felonies in the mishandling of classified documents on her personal email account. And by the way, 
Chapter 1 is devoted to the disparity of treatment, the unequal uh, system of justice that was applied to the Clinton case and the Donald Trump case. And so uh, one of the most amazing things is James Comey actually found in his original statement uh, about Hillary Clinton that she had committed crimes. He wrote it down. She was grossly negligent, which is right out of the statute. Then he goes to the staff members that you mentioned, and he says, but I want to clear her anyway. And they said, you know, Mr. Comey, with all due respect, you can't, you, you've convicted her in this statement. So what they did was they selectively edited the words grossly negligent out and substituted something that sounded less innocuous that wasn't actually in the criminal code. And they were being pressured by Obama's Department of Justice to do that. And you'll read in the book how Lisa Page, for example, confesses that it was the DOJ, Loretta Lynch's decision, telling us we're not going to prosecute Hillary Clinton. I mean, that is just amazing. She received a get out of jail free card from Barack Obama and Loretta Lynch. And so, you know, these are the same people that pursued with vengeance Donald Trump once they cleared Hillary Clinton. The book is Witch Hunt, the story of the great, greatest mass delusion in American political history. The author is Greg Jarrett, who's with us here in Midtown Manhattan. Uh, now, Greg, you mentioned this exoneration, uh, this exculpation of Hillary Clinton, the press conference that James Comey gave, that amazing press conference right. uh, where he spoke for about 10 minutes and he said, she did this, she did that, she did the other, and I'm watching this, and many Americans probably watched and said, oh my God, <laughs> she's going to jail. And then he says, however, and then you just see all of the air go out of the balloon. Right. And he said, well, you know, no, no credible prosecutor would pursue this case, I believe. That was July 5, 2016, I yeah. think. Uh, that first draft of the speech he gave, if I'm not mistaken, was written on May 5, uh, 2016, exactly That's right. two months before. That was before Hillary Clinton had been interviewed. I believe something like 16 or 17 other witnesses had not been interviewed yet. Now you would, uh, have been an attorney in, in the past. You obviously have a lot of contacts in the legal profession. You know prosecutors. Is it unusual for prosecutors to start writing exoneration documents two months before anybody has been interviewed? <laughs> Yeah, or I mean, is it's this, is this a typical thing you, you learned how to do in law school. Yeah, you do it at the very end after you've interviewed all the witnesses. Not before collected, you've talked to people, yeah, right? Yeah, collected yeah. all of the evidence. They hadn't interviewed 17, 17 key people, including Hillary Clinton herself. And already, James Comey's writing this exoneration statement. Um, and he makes the mistake that I mentioned, gross negligence. And, you know, metadata shows it was Peter Strzok with his a paramour, Lisa Page, they're both cheating on their spouses. Um, <laughs> unbelievable. Um, like a soap opera. <laughs> yeah, just like a soap opera. They're on a computer just before, you know, the Hillary Clinton exoneration is announced, and they're changing the language to clear her. Um, you know, it's, to me, it's, it's corruption of the system of justice by the people that we entrust to enforce the law and you know, uh, administer justice in America. This was a prime example of injustice. Extraordinary. Uh, Greg, your comment here uh, ties into to a comment we got from Marianne in Hanover Township, Pennsylvania. She asked this question, do you think anyone will be held accountable on the left uh, for the Russian hoax? And it occurs to me, you, uh, we're doing this live book signing with you here. Uh, witchhuntbook.com is where you can find this book if you'd like to buy a copy. Uh, you're not the only author who's written about this. As a matter of fact, James Comey got a book deal. James <laughs> Comey wrote a book about this. Uh, Andrew McCabe, the uh, acting FBI chief who took over the F FBI after uh, Comey got fired, uh, he got a deal with CNN. He's now uh, oh, yeah. on, on air pontificating about John things. John Brennan's on MSNBC, yeah, Clapper's yeah. on CNN, yeah. So my, my question then is, um, is anybody going to pay any price for this, either disbarment, fines, imprisonment, or is it just going to be a collection of book deals and TV deals for all these people engaged in in this tremendous act of, of injustice that you well, described in your book? Well, uh, Marianne, thank you for the question. It's a great question. It's probably the question I get asked the most. People are very impatient. Um, they want to see uh, the wheels of justice move more quickly. Unfortunately, they generally don't. And as, as DeRoy mentioned, I opened the book by saying that, you know, inventing a lie is easy, spreading the lie is easier, unraveling the truth is hard. It is a slow, arduous, process to unspool the truth because people have attempted to cover up 
their malicious, malevolent acts, um, their crimes in my book. Will they be held accountable is the question. And I actually have great confidence in the Attorney General William Barr. This is a man who cares deeply about the rule of law. He's dedicated his life to it. He is an honorable man, and I think if he uh, is presented with sufficient evidence, he will present that evidence to a grand jury for criminal indictments. Two things uh, are in play right now. The Inspector General Michael Horowitz's report about, uh, mostly about the FISA abuse, how people lied to the FISA court to spy on the Trump campaign. But the second component is Barr made it very clear, he announced it you know, early on, right after he was sworn in, in April, that he was launching an investigation uh, and had appointed U.S. Attorney from Connecticut, John Durham, to investigate. Durham has been going full speed ahead. Durham's not waiting for the Inspector General report. He's already been interviewing people. He has been gathering evidence, collecting documents and records. Uh, they've already together Durham and Barr traveled to Italy twice. Uh, they have been in close contact with Australia, uh, Ukraine, Great Britain. Um, the foreign meddling was not just a myth as it pertains to Donald Trump, but a reality as it pertains to the Hillary Clinton campaign and the Democratic National Committee. Uh, so much is being talked now about Ukraine and the president's telephone call to the Ukrainian president asking for his assistance. In what? In Durham's official <laughs> current uh, investigation. And, you know, as I pointed out on air, we have a treaty with Ukraine. They're obligated to do this. They haven't always abided by it. Uh, and so Trump was simply asking, please abide by your agreement. Please help us in our investigation. So this was not some wacky thing that Trump came no. up with. No, uh, and you know, the media keeps saying, oh, that's been debunked. No, it hasn't been debunked. I explain in my book, the Democratic National Committee hired a subcontractor uh, who was working with Ukrainians to dig dirt on Donald Trump for the benefit of Hillary Clinton to influence the 2016 election. Uh, and there is fairly persuasive evidence it occurred. I think the Ukrainian court actually yes. uh, came up to that, came they, up that conclusion. The Ukrainian court came to that conclusion, and they have now been handing over that evidence uh, to the Department of Justice. We know that because the DOJ has told us that. Uh, this is a tough question, Greg. What do you think of the news media's behavior throughout the Russian hoax? Abysmal. And the witch hunt? It's been abysmal. And in fact, chapter six of my book, The Russia Hoax, uh, 54 pages of the most abysmal media malpractice in my lifetime. And I'm 64 years old. I've been in the business of 40 years. Um, and I, there was such gross recklessness on the part of the media. They were so quick to publish stories or go on the air with stories about intelligence leaks that they simply trusted were true. Many of them were not. They didn't vet these stories. They didn't try to corroborate or verify the information. They simply took it on faith as if it were gospel. Um, they treated the dossier like it was scripture, when in fact it was you know, phony Russian disinformation. So there's been no shortage of media malpractice in the age of Trump. And in chapter six, I go after the media for all of their uh, mistakes and their recklessness, their negligence. Um, and it's no wonder. And, and by the way, I name names and identify stories. And you know, there are 1,500 footnotes in this book. Everything is sourced. Well documented. Huh? So anybody who you know, says, ah, Jared's just making it up. It's a conspiracy, <laughs> blah, blah, blah. Um, everything is sourced. I use absolutely no anonymous sources. And the media is not going to be terribly happy with chapter uh, six, but it's the truth. So frankly, I don't care what they think. Now, Greg, we've talked about, as we discuss uh, Witch Hunt, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history. Uh, we've discussed the uh, uh, White House. We've discussed the Department of Justice, the FBI, uh, the intelligence community, 
as well as the media. These are major institutions that govern us and watch over those who govern us. Right. Uh, and it's very important in a country to have institutions in which you can believe. Do, do you think that we can regain confidence in these institutions, or is the institutional decay uh, as a result of this scandal so deep that people are just going to turn their back on, on these institutions that are so vital to this constitutional republic of ours? Uh, it, it will take, assuming that this mess can be cleaned up and the truth uh, revealed, the full truth, um, it may take a decade for Americans to have any confidence in the FBI or, uh, you know, the CIA or any of the 17 um, alphabet uh, intelligence agencies. Because, as I say, this, this malignant force was out to subvert the rule of law and undermine the democratic process. And Americans are beginning to uh, understand the full... Uh, level of their malevolence. And that's damage that is not easily repaired. You know, James Comey, um, I write in the book, has done more damage to the FBI than J. Edgar Hoover. And that, that's saying something. Um, and Andrew McCabe was right along with him, and Peter Strzok and Lisa Page, and the whole gang. And I, you know, I name names, and I go through uh, their actions, and many of which I identify as potential crimes. Extraordinary. Uh, if you're interested in getting a copy of Witch Hunt, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history, you can go to witchhuntbook.com and order a copy there. Uh, let's take a question from uh, one of our viewers. This is David in Falls Church, Virginia. He asks, what do you think is the most damning piece of evidence showing the scale of corruption is that you could tell someone who doesn't believe? Um, there are so many examples. I'll, I'll give you just one. The appointment of the special counsel uh, by Rod Rosenstein was an act of pure vengeance. Uh, it wasn't uh, according to the regulations or the law. It was an act of retribution. Uh, Rosenstein, you'll recall, wrote the memo uh, recommending the firing of James Comey. He thought he'd be a hero because Democrats and Republicans both had called for the firing of Comey. What happened was that Democrats became livid uh, and leveled stinging criticism at Rosenstein. He became emotionally upset, overwrought, and angry. And he vented his anger at, at Trump. He blamed Trump for his plight. And so in an act of retaliation, he appointed the special counsel, Robert Mueller. And he knew what he had done was wrong. I recount the story in the book. When confronted the day that he appointed Bob Mueller's special counsel, uh, and challenged about what he did. He literally cowered behind and slightly below his desk and blubbered, am I going to get fired? Which is quintessential Rod Rosenstein. He doesn't care about the law. He doesn't care about fairness. Regulations be damned. Um, he cares about Rod Rosenstein. Am I going to get fired? Am I going to keep my job? This is the same Rod Rosenstein that conspired with McCabe to secretly wear a wire to record the president and recruit cabinet members to invoke the 25th Amendment uh, to remove the president. Uh, and when the story finally broke, he rushed over the White House to try to save his job, to beg that he not be fired. He eventually met on Air Force One with President Trump. And I, I sat down in the Oval Office and I, I talked to the president for about an hour about a variety of things, that, all of which are in the book. And I asked him about that Air Force One meeting. What did Rod Rosenstein tell you? You'll, you'll read the answer in the book, but suffice it to say that Rosenstein did what he always does. He lied. Mm, that's true. Um, we're talking about witch hunts, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history with the author Greg Jarrett tonight. Uh, witchhuntbook.com is where you can go online if you'd like to order a copy. Uh, let's go to another question from one of our viewers. Randy in Cincinnati, Ohio asked a question that I want to ask you as well, uh, which is, uh, as you wrote this book, what, if anything, surprised you? <clears throat> yeah, you know, um, it's a great question there. I must say I was surprised in every chapter of this book. Yeah, the more I began digging, the more I realized how deep the corruption went. 
not just at the FBI, but the Department of Justice, uh, John Brennan and his CIA, James Clapper, the Director of National Intelligence. Um, you know, there's so many, all of these, there are nine chapters in the book, and they, they are standalone chapters. You can read just a chapter and it tells a unique story. One of the chapters is lying and spying. Another chapter is called Clinton Collusion. Uh, it was actually Hillary Clinton who was colluding uh, with foreign nationals, a British spy, and paying for Russian <laughs> disinformation. So when you think about it, Donald Trump didn't collude with Russia, but Hillary Clinton did. The media paid no attention to what Hillary Clinton did, and they devoted uh, their resources and energy to what Donald Trump didn't do. Um, so, you know, all of these chapters, one of the great injustices <clears throat> is chapter eight. It's called uh, Collateral Damage, and it's, it centers on General Michael Flynn, this, you know, wonderfully uh, honest, honorable man who had served in the military his entire life. He's a three-star general. He was ambushed uh, by Comey and McCabe and Peter Strzok and another FBI agent. They set him up. They told him, oh, we just want to come over, have a casual conversation. You don't need a lawyer for this. You don't need to tell the White House counsel uh, office for this. Um, and they entrapped him. Um, what's curious is that the two agents, including Peter Strzok, who walked out of the interview, uh, which was set up under the phony pretense of the Logan Act, which is a fallowed law and absurd, but uh, the, the two agents walk out and they go over to the FBI building and they write in the report that uh, Flynn was telling the truth. So how is it possible that Robert Mueller um, could prosecute a three-star uh, general w with lying when in fact he told the truth? Um, people say, well, why did Flynn cop a plea? Because he was broke trying to defend himself. Uh, his bank account was empty. He was going into debt. He had to sell his only home. But mostly because Bob Mueller, unprincipled, unscrupulous, unconscionable, was threatening to prosecute General Flynn's son for FARA violations. That's, um, That's it, the it, Foreign Agency yeah. Registration Act, correct? Right, yeah. right. So, which, which, you know, for decades, if you violate the FARA law, you get to retroactively register as a foreign agent. You don't go to jail you know, for that. You don't go to jail for that. But Bob Mueller was going to, you know, prosecute with a vengeance uh, General Flynn's son. Uh, you know, you'll be disgusted by the time you finish reading Chapter 5, which is called um, Mueller's Magnum, The Folly of Mueller's Magnum Opus, uh, in, in which I pick apart you know, page by page, the Mueller report. Um, it was a travesty and a smear. This is a man, Bob Mueller, who reversed the burden of proof and inverted the presumption of innocence, and it was shameful conduct. You mentioned a very important detail in the uh, Michael Flynn um, interrogation, I guess, at the White House. Soon after he became National Security Advisor, he got a call, I believe it was from Peter <coughs> Strzok, saying, hey, I'm going to send a couple of agents over, maybe call me, call I forget who called. Uh, and said, don't worry, you don't need an attorney, we'll just ask you a couple of questions. When they said you don't need an attorney, immediately the word that popped up in my mind was Miranda, Miranda rights. You yeah. Know, you have the right to an attorney if you don't have one provided, so I know he was not arrested, but didn't this completely violate the, if not the letter, at least the spirit of the entire yeah. uh, Miranda decision? Sure, I mean, one can make that argument. Um, Miranda could be a, a little bit tricky. If, you, uh, if you're a suspect, yes, you have to be given Miranda rights. Um, but of course, that's a very subjective, you know, term, suspect. Um, and you know, McCabe and Strzok and Comey could have said, "Well, we didn't think he was a suspect. We just were curious about it." No, if you actually look at the documents, many of them I recite in the book, it's pretty clear that they they set him up. Uh, they wanted to get Trump, and they thought they could get Trump through Flynn. So they blow uh, the dust off of the uh, archives of the criminal code and come up with the Logan Act, 
you know, which is an unconstitutional law, which is why nobody's ever been prosecuted. Um, but it, it basically says you, you cannot, uh, a private citizen cannot interfere in uh, diplomatic negotiations between the United States and a foreign nation. Well, it had no application and they knew it because when Michael Flynn was having a conversation with the Russian ambassador, it was during the transition. He wasn't a private citizen, he was acting as a, an, an official in the income, incoming administration. I interviewed a, a professor who's written a book about presidential transitions and he laughed and he said, you know, when I brought up the Logan, he said, are you kidding me? Every incoming administration has, you know, hundreds of conversations with foreign leaders. Uh, it, it can't possibly be a violation of the You're Logan. supposed to do that because yeah. you, you don't want to have uh, the U.S. <coughs> government meeting people for the first time after the inaugural parade. Right. You want, you want that to mesh as soon as the oath of office is taken. Yeah, you've got all these challenges, uh, foreign policy challenges. You, you know, you have to start uh, setting up relationships. And, uh, you know, the professor said, are you kidding? It would be malpractice if they didn't absolutely right. have so these what, what we absolutely expect from them. Right. So it was all a pretense. It was a setup, again, by McCabe and Comey and Strzok. And the book that Greg is signing right now is Witch Hunt, uh, his latest book on the controversies involving the Russia hoax and uh, this ongoing, at this point, about three-year-long scandal involving uh, President Trump and, and uh, the efforts by many who don't like him to get him out of office. Uh, let's go to a question here from uh, uh, Philip, uh, Philip in Swan, Iowa. Sort of a bipartisan question. Uh, don't both political parties have culpability, not necessarily equally, for the mass delusion uncovered in your book? Both parties? He says yes, but both parties, both political parties. Do they have culpability? Maybe not uh, equal, but do they have any? No, I don't think so. Um, I mean, I think that there were, uh, for a time, you know, some Republicans who were rather gullible. Uh, but I don't, you know, th this was perpetrated by um, the Democratic National Committee, the Hillary Clinton campaign, foreign governments who were doing some spying of their own on the Trump campaign, providing confidential undercover informants. Uh, Stefan Halpert comes to mind, and I talk about him at length in the book. But it was mostly, you know, these people in our own government that thought they knew better than uh, you, the American voter. Uh, 62 million, you know, people voted for Donald Trump. Um, and they didn't care. Uh, you know, so they conjured this lie that he was a Russian agent. And, and they, they hung it on the dossier. The dossier, you know, is 17 different memos written over a period of several months by Christopher Steele. Um, in he was which a former he, British spy, correct? Former British spy, MI6. Uh, apparently he's not, wasn't very much uh, of a good spy. Um, <laughs> I refer to him as the maladroit spy. Uh, but, you know, this is a guy who hadn't been in Russia in more than a decade. And he, met, he gets hired, and within roughly 10 days to two weeks, he comes up with the first memo in his dossier. So that should have tipped the FBI off when they first saw it uh, on July 5th, 2016. It would be impossible to come up with that kind of information even if you were well embedded in Russia. But it's almost as if Christopher Steele just picked up the phone call, the phone and called the Kremlin and said, hey, what do you got on Donald Trump? And they just gave it to him. And, and if it went something like that, they must have been laughing their butts off in the Kremlin at the phony stuff they were feeding Christopher Steele. And you know, the, the Russians are very clever about this sort of thing. I talked to an expert in in Russia, um, and he said, what they always do when they feed you disinformation, it's like 80, 85% disinformation, but they'll, they'll throw a couple of tidbits of truth. And I go through those tidbits of truth in the book, and the tr those truths were just a matter of public record. That Carter Page, for example, had flown uh, to Moscow to deliver a speech. Well, Barack <laughs> Obama had too, just a few years it's earlier. It's not against the law, is it? Yeah, yeah it's not against the law. <laughs> I mean, I think we have roughly, what is it, two or 300,000 people uh, in Russia every year. Uh, we have major I was businesses. There yeah, I mean, I've been there. We have major businesses there. Um, 
And so, uh, you know, so, so they threw in a little tidbit of truth here and there to, to lend the dossier some credibility. But, you know, I mean, I've read that dossier a uh, hundred times. I never failed to laugh. It's a hoot and a holler because it is so ridiculous. Uh, and yet the FBI treated it as if it were scripture, uh, some ecumenical document that, you know, they bowed to. And they tried mightily uh, for more than a year to verify something, anything, uh, in there that wasn't just a matter of public record. And as John Solomon uh, has reported, uh, they came up with nothing. They had a whole flow sheet and it was empty of all the allegations and then the proof that the FBI had discovered and it was empty, they had no proof. Well, we're here in Midtown Manhattan with uh, Greg Jarrett, the author of Witch Hunt, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history. Uh, and if you're interested in getting a copy of that book, of this book, it's witchhuntbook.com, witchhuntbook.com. You can order your copy there. There, it's, that's what it looks like. Uh, now, Greg, this Endless War show, I think, would have crushed just about anyone else. Yeah. And yet, like Elton John, President Trump is still standing. How has he survived all of this? Well, you know, I opened one of the chapters um, with a quote from Donald Trump from my interview with him in the Oval Office in late June. Uh, the last thing I did before I finished the book uh, was to interview him. I wanted to gather together all the evidence uh, and write the book, and then the last thing I did was interview him. One of, the, one of the funnier quotes in the book is, you know, I ask him that very question. Um, how have you managed to hold up? I mean, every time I see the guy, you know, he's not down. None of this stuff, you know, bothers him the way, it, you know, Nixon, you know, became encamped in the White House and wouldn't leave and, you know, locked himself behind closed doors. And Trump said, you know, most guys would be in the corner sucking their thumb. Uh, he said, but I, I found it to be a challenge. Um, and that, you know, that speaks volumes about the character of the guy. He's, he's pretty darn resilient. I mean, no president in America has been under siege the way he has since the moment he was sworn in. If you think I'm kidding, one of the uh, big bold headlines in the Washington Post the day of his inauguration was the, uh, the impeachment of Donald Trump is underway. I mean, think about this. This is during the inaugural parade. Yeah, right? yeah. Right? He hadn't even gotten over to the White House yet to unpack his bags. <laughs> you know, he He's hadn't even impeached. put away his red ties yet. And, uh, and here he is, you know, he's got all of these Democrats who had, since the moment he won in November, had been marshalling their resources to mount uh, an effort to impeach him. And he hadn't done anything yet, except raise his right hand and solemnly swear he's gonna protect the Constitution. Uh, it's really unbelievable what he has gone through. And, and there's another quote in the book from the president, he said, what happened to me should never happen to another candidate. It should never happen to another president of the United States. And I hope it never does, but the way the malignant force operates in Washington, D.C., it could happen again. Uh, Greg, let me ask you this as we uh, start to wind things down here. Uh, you've seen, unfortunately, we've seen on the news, uh, People uh, like Antifa, these far left groups physically attacking people. Uh, people like Andy No uh, actually getting a cerebral hemorrhage from right. being attacked by Antifa um, terrorists, really, I call them, in uh, Portland. I, clearly nothing like that's happened to you, but have you been attacked in any sense by the left uh, since you uh, oh, documented yeah. this, this corruption yeah. in, in the witch hunt in your previous book, The Russia Hoax? You know, um, by the left, uh, you know, I, I get insulted, ridiculed, and demeaned on a daily basis, yeah. Um, you know, I ride public transportation, you know, I take the train. And most people are nice, God bless them. Um, and they come up and they say, like your work, keep at it. You, you, you've, you're uncovering the truth and we appreciate it. But you get some people who are pretty ugly. Um, and, uh, you know, comes with the territory. I get a lot of, uh, hate mail, um, but thankfully it is uh, way outweighed by the number of very kind, thoughtful letters I receive from people um, who say thank you. And I appreciate those uh, letters sincerely. 
Uh, Greg, in that uh, spirit of, of thanking these people who uh, you run to run into on public transit, who are gracious of you, is anybody is there anyone you'd like to thank uh, who helped you bring this uh, book into uh, into print? Yeah, you know there are a lot of people who made this possible. There have been so many great reporters um, who didn't buy into uh, the Russia hoax, who didn't, uh, who felt that this this witch hunt uh, was not just wrong, but fundamentally unfair. And, you know, some of those reporters are John Solomon, Catherine Herridge, uh, Sarah Carter, Byron York has written a lot of great columns. Jonathan Turley, a very fine law professor, has always been clear-headed. Alan Dershowitz, who's, you know, a Democrat and a liberal. Um, I was on with him tonight. It, but an honest guy. But an <laughs> honest guy. And your work has been extraordinary as well, Deroy Murdoch. Um, is really one of the great journalists in America. His columns are so beautifully written and elegant and eloquent, both. Uh, and it's funny because we've become friends and colleagues, but um, I started reading these columns years ago by this guy named Deroy Murdoch, and I was like, wow, this guy's really good. <laughs> this guy's really smart. Wow, he writes really well. And then we met, and, we met. and it was a pleasure. Uh, at the time I was anchoring the news for Fox News, we would have you on as a guest. And uh, you are as eloquent in person as you are in your columns. Um, and so uh, that's how our friendship began. So, you know, so many great people. Um, you know, there's, I will say that Sean Hannity has sort of led the way. Uh, he has provided a voice for a great many people. Um, who didn't believe in the hoax and who were determined to uncover the truth. And, uh, but for his tireless work day in and day out, um, you know, this book wouldn't have been possible. Uh, Rush Limbaugh has been tremendous uh, in telling the truth. So, the, I mean, I'm forgetting people, and for that I apologize, but, you know, not the entire press corps is, is biased. Uh, some of them are actually honest and hardworking. Uh, let's uh, pose one last question as I think our time is just about up. Um, at witchhuntbook.com, you can get a copy of uh, Witch Hunt by Greg Jarrett. Uh, there a lot of books out there. You know, we've got uh, Christmas and Hanukkah and whatnot coming up before too long. Uh, what would you say to somebody who's debating whether or not to get this book versus getting something else or no book at all? on uh, Amazon or witchhuntbook.com or wherever it is people go to pick yeah, up their books. You know, I've looked at other books and, they're, and some of them are good. Um, I think this is the definitive account of this two and a half going on three year saga of, of a corrupt deep state that attempted to uh, evict this president from the White House for purely political reasons or personal animus. They just didn't like him. They didn't like the man. They didn't like his policies. Uh, and so this book, I think, tells the whole tale. The first book, uh, The Russia Hoax a year ago, um, was, I think, if I do say so myself, prescient. Everything in that book turned out to be true. I wouldn't change a word in that book, but so much new evidence has been revealed in the course of the last 14, 15 months since that book came out, that this book, Witch Hunt, is, is I think, the real complete story of it. Um, don't let the 500 pages intimidate you um, because as I say each chapter is self-contained. It tells a story in and of itself but from beginning to end. How it all began, who was behind it, um, their you know, machinations that almost surely uh, violated numerous uh, laws and, you know, the amazing thing is now we're into a different witch hunt. But the story of this witch hunt really sets the table for what's going on now. Now I call it the Ukraine collusion <laughs> witch hunt, uh, the pelosi Schiff witch hunt. Uh, the president did not abuse his power uh, in his conversation with the Ukrainian president. Um, the people who are seeking to impeach him are abusing their power. 
They know it wasn't a crime because the Department of Justice has looked at the telephone conversation and said, it's not a crime, it's not a violation of campaign finance. So they're using this nebulous term, oh, it must be an abuse of power. Um, it's a phrase of shifting the sands of interpretation and, and subjective opinion, and that's exactly what the framers did not want. They didn't want a president to be uh, removed from office for purely political reasons. The book, Witch Hunt, the story of the greatest mass delusion in American political history by Greg Jarrett. I'd like to say thank you to the folks at HarperCollins, publicist Teresa Dooley, and all of you watching and listening by Facebook, YouTube, and across the internet. And of course, Lauren Baskin and Premier Marketing made this technologically possible. Uh, thank you, of course, to the author of tonight's Deroy, book. always good hanging out with, hanging you. with you. I enjoy you. And again, thank you for taking the time to, uh, to sit here with me. And I hope, I hope you'll buy the book. I think you'll like it. I think it'll be worth it. And hey, the holidays are coming up, so there you go, under the Christmas tree or Hanukkah, whatever. Very good. He's Greg. I'm Deroy. Thank you very much for tuning in. Good night. Good night.